It was the best of times in the worst of times. So my heart was beating so quickly and so loudly that the microphone picked it up. Andy Cohen called me and fired me. Wow. They were vicious. What were they vicious about? Didn't like me. I didn't do anything. I stayed home. Why? If you stay home, nobody can write about you. So it took me seven years to get the kitchen on Food Network after that. It's a real mind f- Yesterday, last night was one of the most shocking nights in my life. I don't think, I mean, it's been four scores and seven years since I've had, or several years since I've had a home cooked meal. And to have a home cooked meal by you of all people alone, the bar has been set very high. I don't know if I've had better cookies in my entire life. Yeah. What was in those cookies, Katie? Why, thank you. Those are my specialty cookies. They're miso chocolate chip cookies. Miso is the secret ingredient to the best chocolate chip cookies. That's so confusing to me. I don't understand how that's such a good ingredient. Listen, the whole table was passing the cookies around, but they kept putting in front of me and I wanted them to stop because I kept eating more and more cookies. <laughs> the, the cookies, there's just something about it. Like the miso makes the chocolate taste chocolatier, chocolatier if that makes any sense. Yeah, no. Like the umami in it. And then the texture of the miso makes you have this really good chewy cookie. Damn, those were good. Those were like, I could have eaten like a whole plate of those. Your notepad out, Lauren. I am getting my notepad out. This is why I wanted to have Katie on the show because I feel like she's very digestible in the way she explains something. Now I'm going to add miso to my cookies. Okay. I want to get the lay of the land with you. I want to go back to when you were a little girl. I want to know what the epiphany was when you decided that you liked to cook. Was it when you were really, really young? Really little. I, I would just hang out in my grandma's kitchen I'm from a really small town in West Virginia, Milton, West Virginia. It's 2,200 people. And my grandma was my babysitter. So I was just always cooking with her. My favorite thing to do is to make biscuits. I was like four years old standing there at the kitchen counter. So we were one of those families that was talking about what we were going to eat at the next meal while we were having a meal. We just loved food, loved cooking. But it was like down home comfort food. I wasn't really exposed to other types of cuisine it was just that kind of like southernish type of food. And then I went to college. I wanted to study journalism and I was working in restaurants. I started reading Bon Appetit and Gourmet and Food and Wine. This was around the time that the Food Network started and I was watching those shows and I thought, could I be a food journalist? I was also watching Sex and the City and thinking, could I be the carry of food? And that was my plan. I just, I wanted to write about food. And then I came to New York and it just kind of all evolved. When when you were young, is it sort of like a way that your family showed love with food? Because I've heard so many different stories about people who have fallen into the food industry. And a lot of them say that their family showed love that way. I think so. I, I think that that was the way that we communicated love and comfort My great aunt and uncle lived in our neighborhood as well. My great grandmother and they all cooked as also. So like my grandma would call up to her sister's house and say, I just made a cake. If Larry wants any cake, come and get it. You know, so it was like everybody was kind of going around eating at each other's houses. And that was the way that we saw each other. That was our hangout. So you you had an association with it. Mm -hmm. Have you always been so driven? Like when you were little, were you a driven person? I was super driven as a kid. Yeah, always. And I can remember being a little girl and I I always liked nice stuff, even though we we didn't have any money growing up. And I remember people saying in front of me, oh, she better marry a rich man. And I'd go, nope, I'm going to make my own money. And it was like a little kid saying that. Like I knew that I always wanted to work. So at what point do you start actually like working? Like wh- wh- oh, when you're living? I think living I started there. babysitting my cousins when I was like 11 and making money. I had my little bank book that I'd write all my deposits in. So I was always really into saving and <laughs> not spending. I'm still like that. I'm a big saver. Um, so I just was always having a job. What's so interesting to me about your career is it sounds like you took all these little tidbits from your childhood and mixed them together to make a recipe of what you (laughs) are today. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, I I took what I loved and made it into a job and made it into a career. So I feel really fortunate that I get to do this that is in a way a hobby. And that's how I earn my living. 
What was the first gig you got that was, you know, where people got to actually see what you were cooking, what you were doing? What was like, what was, who was the first people that put you on? Um, well, let's see. I did extra some. I would go on extra and do little interview segments. And then I started a food blog back in like the dark ages of blogs. Like I didn't even know what a blog was. And one of my girlfriends said, do you want to start a blog with me? And I was like, sure. And so we were making dishes and like holding up a white poster board as a reflector, not knowing what we were doing. But we had seen someone who did that at a photo shoot. So we figured we should do it. Um, And we started this blog. And then one day I got an email through the blog that said, we're casting Top Chef. It's going to be a new cooking show. We produce Project Runway and Project Greenlight. Would you come in and read for the host? And I thought, this must be fake. And I searched them, and sure enough, they were real. And the next day, I went into 30 Rock and read for it. And two days later, I was on a plane to San Francisco and shot the first season. What was the, the things that you had to do before before getting on a plane to Top Chef that were hard? Like when you look back, what are the, mm-hmm. the hard things that you had to do to sort of get to where you were? Well, that happened really quickly for me. And I think that that's why that didn't work out. So I only did one season of that show and then I got let go. And I think it's because I was ill prepared. I was green. I was not ready for it. I had done such a minimal amount of television at that point to know how to to be able to navigate how to host a show, especially a competition show at that young of an age. I just didn't have it in me and it it wasn't the right vehicle. Uh, before that, I had worked in restaurants. I actually got a job as a fishmonger when I first moved to the Hamptons. That was my gig. What exactly and, is a fishmonger? Again? <laughs> <laughs> so I worked the fish counter. Okay. And I uh, I was cutting up fish and selling it to people. And that was my job. And then I had my food blog. I wrote some for Hamptons Magazine. But I certainly was not in a position to be hosting that show. And it, it did not work out. So what is it like to go to this huge network television show, ill-prepared, and being thrown into something that you don't know what the fuck you're doing? And were you always comfortable being in front of people? Yeah, I was pretty comfortable being in front of people. And and I think I was a, a confident person and that's why I did it. It was kind of like naivete in a way of just like, yeah, sure, I can do this. And I got there and I was I was pretty scared once it started. Once those cameras started rolling, I remember I hated my outfit <laughs> for the first episode and I remember just feeling so self-conscious. Did they dress and you in it or do you pick it? They dressed me. Okay. And it was purple, and I remember thinking, and purple velvet, and I remember thinking, oh, God. this I, Purple's a risky color. Yes, it was not a good look. And uh, the first episode, I had, when I had to eliminate the guy, so my heart was beating so quickly and so loudly that the microphone picked it up, and we had to do it a second time, which, of course, I didn't want to have to do because I already was <laughs> so nervous doing it the first time. Um, so it was kind of like doomed from the beginning. And is it your heart beating because you're nervous to eliminate him or because you're nervous you're on TV or both? I was nervous to eliminate him. He uh, was aggressive and kind of somebody who had a, a very um, combative personality, perfect for reality television. So I was really nervous and I was I was nervous because also people are putting themselves out to be on these shows. And even now when I I do a Beat Bobby Flay and I have to tell somebody that they're going home, I feel bad. I feel bad for them. Like they're trying so hard. Yeah, nobody wants to just crush somebody's dreams. Right, you know? right. Well, not, not to make you feel worse. But <laughs> yeah, but it, that's how you feel. You feel like, oh gosh, this person now has got to go home and... So when Top Chef doesn't work out, what did that feel like sort of getting back on the plane and having to go back to reality? Well, I didn't know that I wasn't getting asked back until the day after the finale aired. Okay. Um, So it was a lot of waiting around and wondering what was going to happen. I kind of knew because it, it, it didn't feel right to me and I could tell that the audience didn't connect like, That was at the time when people were, I mean, people still are posting comments online, but it was before social media. But if you went on any of the blogs and read the comments, they were vicious. 
And what were they vicious about? That that didn't like me. Um, I think a lot of it was that I had a famous husband, and it was it, which is probably the only reason I got hired to do it in the first place. Let's be honest. That I had a famous last name, and so Bravo likes that. Um, so the day after the finale aired, Andy Cohen called me and fired me, and it was a really like uncomfortable. Um, you know, it's bad for your ego. Anybody, even if you don't want to do something like it hurts. So it definitely hurt. And I had a really hard time in my career recovering from that because in that role, I was not myself. I, the first day the producer said to me, we want you to act like Heidi Klum on Project Runway. We want you to be cold, icy. I remember they wanted to cut my hair short so that I looked like more authoritative and thank goodness I wouldn't totally let them cut my hair. Totally not your personality to yeah, be cold and icy. Yeah, not my personality. And I think that was one of the reasons I was so nervous because it was like, I'm not an actress and I'm having to play this other persona. Um, so I had a hard time recovering from that being the first way that people had seen me on television. So it took me seven years to get the kitchen on Food Network after that because people just saw me one way. And at the time, you mentioned your husband. Was was he helping? Like, obviously, he had a stage presence and had mm -hmm. been in that world. Was he, was he kind of coaching you through this and saying, "Hey, you can like go start again and you can do something else"? Yeah, he was very supportive, and I I remember um, him telling me, "You got to know that the difference between people in the music business and people in the television business. Music business people will lie to your face, but they don't really expect you to believe it." Television people will lie to your face and expect you to believe it. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, give us an yeah I don't, I don't um, get what you mean. We don't know if we're bringing you back for the show or not. We haven't made any decisions yet. When really they knew all along and they waited till the day after the finale aired to cover themselves. Whereas a music person would do what? They'd lie to you, but they wouldn't expect you to believe that they were lying. Got it. And, and the TV, they wanted me to... They expected me to believe what they were telling me. I didn't realize that you were simultaneously on this show and married to your first husband. Mm -hmm. How how did you meet your first husband being a girl who's on doing a blog? You're fresh out of college. What's the meaning of that like? Well, I actually met him while I was still in college. You met him in college. So, so I came to New York City for a weekend with my roommate to look at the French Culinary Institute. I wanted to go to school there after graduation. And we were um, in the Peninsula Hotel because someone told us go there rooftop to have a drink and see a view of the city. And I literally bumped into him. I was on my purse in the hotel lobby and bumped into him. And I didn't recognize him, but my friend said, oh, Billy Joel, we're going to the roof for a drink. Why don't you meet us? And like a half hour later, sure enough, he came up and that were, was how we met. Were you familiar with his work? Kind of. I mean, I wasn't like a fan. I knew Uptown Girl and Piano Man, and that was about it. And uh, we had drinks. He took us to dinner. I thought, he probably knows a better restaurant than we do. So sure, let's go. <laughs> and, and we went to dinner. And then he said, I've got this Broadway show on. Do you guys want to go see it? And I said, sure. He jumps on stage, sings the last couple songs of the show. And I thought that was his gig. I thought every night he went to his Broadway show and sang the songs. I didn't realize he was doing it for us. I was just like a one time. Thing. People I, I, are I'm kind of with you, though. I would think the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was somehow unimpressed. <laughs> it's like here I was this 21 year old living in Ohio at the time going to school. And I just was like, oh, yeah, this is just this is New York's fun. This is All what it's like. the guys fall in love with the girls when they're unimpressed. The <laughs> trick is be unimpressed and ignore. You guys right. all can't we were, handle an unimpressed girl. They're all the girl. same. Well, and I imagine especially somebody like that had reached that level of success when, when you're like, oh, whatever. It's like that, that has probably what was probably unique for him as well. Right. 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 So when you OK, you grow up the way you do small mm -hmm. town home cooking and all of a sudden you're married to somebody with that kind of notoriety and you enter that world. No, we're it, not at the married stage. No, yet. But, I need to go back to the dating. <laughs> no, but hold on. Okay. But oh, you're dating. Fine. Dating. But, but however you want to say, it. Uh -huh. is that like, is that strange for you or are you just kind of like, what's going on? Um, it, it's definitely, was like two different worlds. I mean, I, I was in school and on the weekend, I didn't tell any of my friends I was dating him. I didn't want anybody to know. 
And Why? Um, because I didn't want people in my business. I didn't want people talking about me and I didn't want people ruining it. Smart. Smart. And and I think that that's, if you're dating anybody, forget it, rock star, anybody, just normal people. When you get other people involved, that's when things start to fall apart. He who talks the most loses the most. I've always believed that. Uh-oh, so, we talk for a living. <laughs> <laughs> but telling stuff on yourself, you know. I guess we're telling stuff on, I'm telling stuff on myself right now. Um, I have a little more wine. <laughs> yeah, I have another glass, right? Um, so on the weekends, I was getting on a private plane, flying around to different places around the country to meet him wherever he was on tour. I remember getting on a private plane by myself for the first time, and there was a big basket of candy. And I was like, oh my God, free candy. And I put it all in my purse. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Like the candy, like the strawberry candies yes. that you get at like Carbone. You're like yeah. stuffing in your purse yeah. and chocolates and everything. Like all the like the basket. Yeah, I, have, I yeah. think that's. Yeah. I think that's like that. You're saying like the catering stuff. But I yes. think that's, I put it in my purse. It's pure. I think that's probably why he fell so deeply in love with you because there's a purity to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it. It's being authentic and real. Yeah, and and not posturing to be anything other than yourself. Um, so it was a really different situation. The um. Last weekend before I graduated, the National Enquirer broke a story on our relationship. And I thought nobody was nobody reads the National Enquirer. I'm fine. And it was the last day it was on newsstands. Somebody at school figured out that it was in there. And then it sold out in every store in the town. And everywhere I went in the college town, people were wanting to ask me about my relationship. And it was like I could not get out of that town fast enough after that. Like in a, in a way where they're like asking you for information or they're asking you like they they think it's cool. What do you mean? Asking for information, like, you know, wanting to know. Th- it was I just was um, I didn't like being on the spot like that. So it was pressure. Yeah. 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 So well, you, like, did you leave the town? Well, I graduated and that was it. That was it. Yeah. And did you move to New York? I moved straight to the Hamptons. And at what point are you guys getting married? Was it quick or slow? It was about a year and a half later. So I went to the Hamptons and I I said, I'm just coming for the summer. I didn't plan on moving to New York. Um, I planned on moving to New York City, not to the Hamptons. I got the job at the fish market. So I was like rock star girlfriend by night and fishmonger by day. I love it. I love that you were a fishmonger. (laughs) So cool. That's amazing. I remember he was like, why do you want to work? I said, I have to work. I I wanted to know about seafood. I was from a landlocked state. And so that was how I was going to learn about fish was working in the fish market. I have a theory about why this happened so fast. Billy Joel took one bite of those cookies. I was like, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not letting these go. Let's talk about Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers is the number one doctor recommended weight management program and the trusted authority in evidence-based weight health. Beyond the science, joining Weight Watchers means you become part of a powerful, passionate community. They're all about community there. We got to learn all about that when we had the CEO on our podcast. The company's purpose is to always inspire healthy habits and lasting weight loss. So how they do this is they focus on behavior change, nutrition, science, and real connections while never giving up on the food that we all love. Personally, I really love how they've evolved their approach to weight loss over the years, and they're really like with the times, which I appreciate. Weight Watchers has helped millions of members on their journeys over the years, and recently they've launched Weight Watchers Clinic, and this provides support to even more people across the weight health spectrum. Most importantly, I think that Weight Watchers knows that weight management is not a one-size-fits-all thing. There are behavioral and biological factors to consider, so they really have a multifaceted approach when it comes to losing weight. Head to www.com slash TSC to see if you qualify. If you do, use our code TSC25 to get your first month free. Plus, you get $25 off your second month. That's www.com slash TSC. If you are a longtime listener of the show, you might know I've been drinking AG1 for about a year thanks to Michael Bostick. He got hooked on AG1 um, by Andrew Huberman. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I noticed that it was a really nice balance to my coffee. So I like to drink it with my coffee. I'll habit stack it. And I just noticed that I had more energy. And that's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement. 
And everything is designed to support your body's universal needs. So things like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. It does all the things. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. If you're feeling overwhelmed with everything on the market, this is a really great place to start. This can replace your multivitamin. So it has prebiotic, probiotic, digestive enzymes. So much of it's designed for gut support. It has magnesium, B vitamins, everything for energy support, vitamin C, zinc to support your immune health. And it's one scoop. What I do is I'll do a bunch of crushed ice. I have this nugget ice that I'm obsessed with. And I'll just drink it down with my coffee. It tastes so good. The little travel packets are amazing to travel with too. They're very efficient. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. And that's why they've been a partner for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packets with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash skinny. That's drinkag1.com slash skinny. Check it out. One thing that I feel like I have down with children (laughs) is their vitamin. I feel really good about the vitamin that I give my kids. I give both of my kids this specific children's vitamin, and I also now give my kids, their probiotic. I keep it in this really cute white Tupperware. And every morning it's like a thing. It's a moment. It's a step in their routine that we do. They love it. They get excited for it. The one that I use is Haya. It's made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk like most of them. Most of them are made with so much crap. This is not. It's formulated with the help of nutritional experts. And most importantly, it's supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals. So you get like vitamin D, you get B12, C, zinc, folate, and everything is designed to support immunity, energy, brain function, mood concentration, teeth, bones, and more. But here's why I really like it as a mom. It's non-GMO. It's vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything you can imagine. This is one of these things that I've made a healthy habit in our morning. It's a special situation. Even if it takes five seconds, they get to pick their color. There's like green and yellow and pink. The special deal is for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50%, 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash skinny. You should know this deal is not available on their regular website. So you're going to go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H.com slash skinny and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. When you go from being in Ohio in college to living in, I'm assuming, a beautiful house in the Mm -hmm. Hamptons with the Hamptons at your fingertips, which is like so bougie and amazing. Was it kind of a mind fuck or was was it feeling natural to you? I actually had a really hard time that summer. I yeah. had um I think that people just looked at me as like the flavor of the week and um didn't take me seriously. I was really young and I get it. Now as an older woman, I would probably look and be like, "Oh god, who's this 21-year-old? Give me a break." Um so I I understand. Um, was there a big age gap? Yeah, he was 54, I was 21. Okay. Damn, yeah. Billy. Yeah. <laughs> or 53. I'm sorry. We were 32 year age gap. Right. Um, so, you know, I get it. I understand now looking back why people may have reacted to me the way that they did. But I was self-conscious and it, and it bothered me. And I remember coming home from the fish market because I'd say to somebody, hi, how are you? What can I what can I help you with? And they go, I'm just looking. And I would come home and go, why are people so mean? <laughs> I'm just saying, how are you today? And it's like, I'm just looking. It's just a different well, energy. It's just a different energy. And now I'm probably the one to go. I'm just looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I will say when we moved to Texas mm-hmm. and you move into that kind of like Southern hospitality, it was and coming from LA. Mm-hmm. It was a mind fuck for us in the beginning where we would walk through the neighborhood on our morning walks and be like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> when people and now, said hi, I was like, what? What's going like, on? Yeah. You're like, why are you talking to me? Well, what do you what's your problem, me? buddy? And now, <laughs> and now I'm like, I'm the guy with the coffee, like waving around at uh-huh. everybody. But it's just like, it's a different thing. And I think mm-hmm. like in a lot of the big cities, it's like, hey, move it on, buddy. Like we don't got time totally. for pleasantries. Totally. So how, w- when you guys got married, was it a big ordeal or did you do something intimate? We had a big wedding and, um, that doesn't seem like your personality to me. Not anymore. No, I'm, I'm not a, you know, when Ryan and I got married, we had 40 people and right. that like felt much more like me and more intimate. Yeah. 
Yeah. So when you have this big wedding, were you like, did you like it at the time or were you kind of like, eh? I did. It was a, I mean, I was so happy and I had a great time. Um, I met one of my very best friends ever as my wedding planner, Marcy Bloom, who you all have met. Hi, Marcy. Uh, so I, I joke, I lost the husband and kept the wedding planner. <laughs> So that was a great thing. And after you came back from Top Chef, you guys were married. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. then after you come back, what happens in your career then? So then I was kind of stagnant for a while. I um, I wrote a book. I wrote a cookbook. And I started doing weekly segments on the early show on CBS, which was their morning show at the time. And so I had my weekly cooking segments. I did that for years. And I loved doing that. It gave me so much more experience. Um, I think the only way to get better at being on camera is to be on camera. And I knew that I liked it. And I knew that if I got to be myself, that I would excel and that I had something to say and and I had to find my voice and I had to find the confidence to to use it. And um, doing those weekly shows really, really helped. And I really had fun with that. And I kept beating down the door of the Food Network. I wanted to be on Food Network. I kept getting no, no, no. We're not interested in her. We're not interested in her. We're not interested in her. And I'd almost given up. And I was in L.A. I thought I was going to move to L.A. I thought maybe I'd try to be a screenwriter. I was staying at the Hotel Bel Air for a month. And it was like day 28 of my 30 days there. And Mark Millette, our friend, was my agent at the time. And he called me and said, there's this new show that they're casting for Food Network and you'd be perfect for it. You need to come back here and and try out for it. And I said, Mark, they have passed on me for seven years. I'm having a good time. I was dating somebody out there. I was going out every night. I was like, I'm not coming back to New York. And he said, you get your ass on a plane and get back here right now. And Mark is very convincing. And so I said, OK, fine. And I got on the plane and I went back and sure enough, I got the kitchen and it changed my life. When you're dating someone who or married to someone who has so much power and so much money, it's it's so unique for you to be like, you know what, I'm actually not going to even look at that. I'm going to go create my own path. Was mm -hmm. that difficult to do? Yes and no. I mean, I never saw any alternative than to have my own path. I always wanted my own thing. And, and that was very important to me. And he understood that and, and supported it to a certain degree. And um, I, I just think that I never thought any other way. Like, I never thought I'm going to sit around and, and not work. Well, I, I always find it interesting, like where people's and like the, I, I try to dissect this a, a lot on, on this show, like where people's ambition comes from, especially mm -hmm. ambition that is, quote unquote, maybe not necessary. For example, like if mm -hmm. you're, you're living in the Hamptons, you have this mm -hmm. life and it's set up and like, by all means, you could kind of like sit back and rest on your laurels, but you continue to push. And I always, I always find that so interesting because on the reverse of that, sometimes you see people with every opportunity in the world just completely squander it and do nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, like, do do you re, do you remember a period of time where like you started to identify that drive, or do you think this was something that was always in you? I think it was just always there, and I don't even know that I knew that it was drive as much as I got a kick out of working like even as a teenager working at the mall like I enjoyed going to work I enjoyed talking to people and having my own money so I just always liked having a job yeah I think like for me I've now that I like I've thought about and dissected into my childhood and I've like you know gone deep into my crazy psyche and I've realized like it, it's what I've been chasing my entire life is just that independence Mm -hmm. Right. And wanting my thing and not having to rely or ask people for permission. And I even like think back to my early years in schools, I was always getting in trouble and always getting kicked out. And I just like hated the idea that somebody could like kind of like put me in a box and control me. And so like for me, that is what I've identified. And it sounds like maybe similar. It's like you just wanted your own yes. independence and your own thing. Yes. You should always have your own thing. And I, I think I don't know if it it's goes back to childhood or, or what I can tie it to. But I've always kind of thought at any moment the rug can be pulled out from under you too. So you better have an escape plan and you you better have something that you know you can fall back on. Maybe that's why I'm such a saver 
And I started out with that little bank book, right? And my deposits in it. I still feel that way. Like that you need to always be prepared for a rainy day. You mentioned when you got to your hotel that you were staying in for a month in Bel Air that you're dating someone new. What's mm -hmm. so how how did you go from that? Did you get a divorce? Obviously, I'm assuming yes. in the Hamptons. So um, I got divorced in let's see, that was 2009, and I was living out in the Hamptons. I was like between the city and the Hamptons at that point. Um, I moved out there pretty much full time. I got really into surfing. I had a surfer boyfriend at the time. Like I, I was way into surf culture. And then I decided, you know, I needed something new. I needed what, what was the next chapter? Like I was kind of at the point where I was not working enough. And I had written a book. I wrote a novel at that point uh, called Groundswell. And I really wanted that to be a movie, um, which years later it did become a movie on Hallmark, but it took like, what was that like eight years um, but I was thinking of moving to LA and starting my next chapter of, um, that food wasn't going to work out and that I should start thinking more about screenwriting or continuing to write fiction. What was it like going through a public divorce like that? That was very trying. And I, I don't know why I didn't think people would really care. And I remember being so surprised getting up in the front page of the New York post being our picture and like this huge picture. And I remember thinking like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is the cover of the paper and having camera people outside my house. And I remember had all the blinds pulled and um, I went I, out to the Hamptons and stayed with friends. And then I was driving back to the city from the Hamptons. And one of my girlfriends was in London at the time and said, you should just come stay with us. And I was driving back to the city and there was a big billboard that said London for American Airlines. And I said, all right. And I went in the house, packed my bag and went back to JFK and flew to London. This was like one week after, and it was still in the press. And just then to I, get out. Yeah. Just to get out of New York. Um, and I got to London and had actually a really great week. <laughs> I, it was like, I just had this escape of riding around on a double decker bus, like with a headset on, like being such a tourist. And after that, it was like everything kind of died down. I took a summer where I did not go out. I um, I didn't go even go to a restaurant to have dinner. I didn't do anything. Wh I why stayed is, home. Why? Because if you stay home, nobody can write about you. If you don't want to be written about, there's a way to not be written about. And so I stayed home. I had friends over all the time, but I did not go anywhere that summer. And it just all died down. And Bill and I had the world's easiest divorce. We separated in June. We were divorced by October. It was not contentious. And then it just all kind of went away. A lot of people would have used that opportunity to go out. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? They would uh -huh. have used that as leverage to become more famous and mm -hmm. go out. It's interesting mm -hmm. to me. It, it, it's, it's interesting because to me, you are famous but it it's it's like you didn't use that as an well, opportunity to get there. You're a bit of an sense? enigma because it's like you're yeah, doing, you're trying so hard to do you know mm -hmm. to get on these platforms and have television, and at the same time mm -hmm. you're also not maybe taking the easy road to get there. I always wanted to be known for the right reasons, uh -huh. and to me, going out and having people write about dating and uh, anything salacious was not of interest to me. And is Mark, um, your agent, advising you at this point or no? Is yeah, Mark would advise me some. I had a really good publicist who said, if you don't want to be written about, stay home. And so I listened to her. And I, I'm still friends with her. And I joke that like I, I've taken it too far because now all I want to do is stay home still. And it's been... <laughs> I mean, you know, with those cookies over a decade later, and I'm still staying home. Your house and those cookies, I'm staying home too. I don't blame you. You know, though, I was thinking like, with in the in the line of the work that we do, sometimes you you talk to different press, or different reporters, different outlets for different reasons. And I was like, as I've become older, like I I don't I think like, listen, sometimes you can't control it, but I think fame for the sake of fame is not always a great strategy. Yes, I mean, you know this, and I. And I think people that have maybe not had that or or want to have that mm -hmm. maybe don't look at it that way. 
Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Totally. It's like you don't yep. want to just be known to be known. Like you, like you. I, I right. think about like you might. It's better to be known for something that you're actually passionate or that you actually care about and that you actually want to pursue. For someone who's who's not famous and they're listening and they're wondering what it's like to be famous, what do you think? Something that would would surprise someone that's maybe like an ugly side i mean i don't think of myself as famous i i think that like i have a job where i'm on tv and i don't really think of myself as being like a famous person um especially when i can compare firsthand to what it's like for someone to have real true iconic fame um and i i think what people don't realize is that people are people yeah and no different everybody's sitting around in their sweatpants at night eating popcorn, watching TV, hanging out, talking about the same stuff. It's not like there's some alternate universe that is so much more exciting. Some people just have jobs that make them famous. I think that's a good one. You do sit around in your sweatpants. Not that you're famous, but... <laughs> so yeah. I wish I just sat around in my sweatpants. That's a much better image than how I actually sit around. <laughs> sit around. <laughs> sit around in your sweatpants. Okay, so go go now to the Bel Air. You said you were dating someone. Is the person that you're dating the husband that you're married to now, Ryan? No. No, that was more of just like a fling. A fling. Okay. Yeah, it was like... You know, I had a couple years of dating around a lot. Good for you. Yeah. Date around. I had a lot of fun. I was not a great dater, I think, because I... Um, I, I put myself out there too much in the sense that like I'd lay my cards on the table. Like if I liked somebody, I let them know that I liked them. So I didn't really quite know how to play the game. And I think part of that was because I got married so young that like I never learned how to how to play it. Um, so, you know, I, I got ghosted from time to time. <laughs> but then tell us about how you meet your husband. So I met my husband, Ryan. I was doing a a show called Beach Bites that was a travel show. And I walked into the production meeting. Well, I briefly met him. He was working on another Food Network show. And he came up to me and said, oh, I'm going to be working on your show. Hi, I'm Ryan. It's nice to meet you. And I remember thinking like, oh, he's cute. But I kind of forgot about it. And it was a couple months later then that we had our first production meeting. And I walked into the meeting and thought, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> he's very, you guys are both very cute. You're a beautiful he's couple. He's so, thank you. Yeah, he's, he's, he's beautiful. He is so handsome. Both it's of you guys. Like, I think he's like my Disney prince. And he is the sweetest person. He has such a great heart. He's such a good dad. Like, just like salt of the earth person. Not a bad bone in his body. He Did, when, when you martini. started, <laughs> Yeah, he does make a mean gin, gin martini. When you started dating him did you know that you wanted him to be the father of your kids eventually no i i thought we were having fun we were on a shoot for six weeks where every couple days we were in a different exotic beach location and i thought it was like being on the bachelor with food like we were having a great time i think he thought the same thing that it was just a fling and um we were keeping it a secret from everybody else we were working with I'd be texting him, come over after. And so it was like this hot romance. It's always sexier when you're keeping it a secret. Right. So we got back afterwards and I thought, I miss this guy. Maybe I'm actually like really into him. And we started seeing each other more. And I asked him to come out to the Hamptons with me for a weekend. And that was kind of what did it. We made roast chicken and watched movies and hung out in bathrobes and drank Aperol spritzes and wine all weekend. And that was solidified our relationship. And that was it. How soon after that did you get married? We got married. I'd say we dated almost two years before we got married. And then Mm -hmm. at what point did you decide that you guys wanted to have kids together? Even before we got married, I was ready to start. And, And I thought like, I was like taking my temperature, like trying to have sex whenever I thought I was ovulating and I was like ready for it. We got married and realized that it wasn't that easy. I thought I'd be pregnant on the honeymoon and months later, still nothing happening. And I found out that I had these fertility issues. So we started IVF. Um, and did four rounds of that until we got pregnant with Iris. Okay, four rounds of IVF is one of, mm-hmm. a lot of women have come on this podcast and talked about IVF, but mm-hmm. four rounds is a lot of And rounds. I did it back to back to back. I oh. took no breaks. I think 
for someone who doesn't understand that process, like, can you really explain what that does? And we talked Mm -hmm. about this a little bit off air, but like not just to your physical body, but mentally. Yes. So I actually, when I was 32, I froze my eggs thinking that that gave me an insurance policy. Like so many people do. I think a lot yeah, of people please think that. go yeah. off on this because so, so we can educate. So people. I remember going in. I went to, um, I mean, probably the most one of the most prestigious fertility doctors, Dr. Zev Rosenwax. He's here in New York. He's a pioneer of fertility medicine. And I remember being 32 and going in his office and he said, tell me why you want to do this. And I said, well, it's like having money in the bank. It's like insurance. And he said, oh, no. Do not be confused. This is not a sure thing just because you're doing this. And I remember kind of being like, "Mm, really? You know, I didn't quite believe what he was telling me, even though he was saying, I think he said, you've got 30% chance that these eggs will be good. They encourage you if you want to make embryos, you have a better chance with an embryo. But I didn't have a person I wanted to make an embryo with. And I didn't want to use from a bank at that point. Better chance with the embryo because you don't have to fertilize it later. Right? Yeah, Is and you can like, not, you can test it too, so you know uh-huh. then you have a successful embryo. It's not um, the same, right? With the egg, you can't do that. Right, right. With the egg, it's a healthy egg, but you don't know if it'll fertilize, and then you don't know when it fertilizes if it's going to be a healthy embryo. You know, all the different steps that go go along through. So, it. if you're looking at it just from like from an insurance policy, you'd say like it's not necessarily not smart to do the eggs, but it, it potentially is a a better insurance policy to do the embryo to have I, the embryo. I, I guess so. Like, I don't want to give anybody advice, yeah, yeah. but that's what I have deduced from it. Okay. Um, I think that, uh, I remember I did the, the round of IVF or I'm sorry, the round of egg freezing with him. And he encouraged me to immediately do another round of egg freezing because I only got five eggs on that. And he said, this really statistically is not enough. And I remember I just felt so bloated and I wanted to exercise. And I said, I'll come back and do it another time. And he was like, "Mm, you really should. You really should go ahead and do another round. And I didn't listen to him. And of course, I never went back and did another round. I'm not even sure if it would have mattered because now knowing that like I didn't really have this huge supply of, of healthy eggs. So when Ryan and I started trying, um, I, I found out I had I, I think it was polyps that had to be removed. I, I think they were uterine polyps. I, I had a couple different surgeries I had to have and then still didn't get pregnant. So then we started IVF and um, got zero embryos the first time. Second time, I think we got one. I had a chemical pregnancy. Then I, I think the third time we we fertilized, we tried fertilizing my frozen eggs. None of those took. I think I had another chemical pregnancy that time. And then um, I had the the fourth and final time with Iris. And, um, you know, I, I think that it actually got easier for me every time, which I know in, maybe in a way doesn't make sense because you'd think it would keep feeling harder and like you were being beaten down each time. But it was kind of like I knew what to expect and my hopes weren't as high because that first time I just thought, well, this will be easy. I'll you go in and they say, oh, you have 18 follicles. And I thought, 18 follicles? I'm going to get all these eggs. I'm going to have like a kindergarten class worth of embryos. And then you end up with zero. So it's like you go from this high point to this low, low point. And at that time, people weren't really talking about this publicly either. So it felt like something I was holding in and and not being my true self and feeling like I had to go on social media and still be smiling and cooking. And it just didn't feel true to myself. So um, I finally fig- figured at that last time, like, listen, I'm not looking for 10. I'm not looking for five. I'm not looking for three. I'm looking for one good one. I just need my one good one. And I got my one good one. One thing that I wish always existed, you guys, is Drizzly. The Drizzly app or drizzly.com is truly amazing. Okay. It is the go-to app for drink delivery. This is amazing during the holidays. You must be 21 plus. It's not available in all locations. But if you want to order maybe some Don Julio Reposado for your margarita or some Kettle One for your cranberry Topo Chico or maybe some Bullet Bourbon for your old fashioned, they have you covered. 
You literally go on your app, you get a drink delivery sent straight to your home. So my mother-in-law is coming into town tomorrow and she likes a very specific dry, crisp champagne. I went on Drizzly and I ordered four bottles for her. So it's like stocked in the fridge, all cute. And after I ordered it, about half an hour later, it came straight to my door and I'm ready to go. It looks like I have my shit together. You know what I mean? (laughs) This is the go-to app for alcohol delivery. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. I personally am such a fan of like being able to save time, especially when it comes to my alcohol delivery. So if I want to get some tequila for my margarita or I want to get some champagne for my mother-in-law, Drizzly has me covered. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. Must be 21 plus. Not available in all locations. I am a big fan of a blowout. I like to go in. I like to get a scalp massage. I like to chill. I like to work on my emails. But the problem is the next day. So the next day, I will wake up and my blowout will fall. But I'm going to introduce you to the new styling tool that is going to give you an effortless curl, especially the next day. It's something that I have been using for touch-ups, and it is called The Curl Secret by Conair. It is super affordable. It's actually on my desk right here, and it's something that you can use to curl your hair and do a really effortless, simple curl. But how I like to use it is what I'll do is after I get my blowout, the next morning I'll wake up and I'll just do a quick five-minute touch-up. Super easy. The best part about this though, and why I like it, is there's a heat protector in it. And what is amazing is it's a ceramic barrel. So the ceramic barrel protects your hair. I am all about protecting the hair. You know I have had quite the journey with my hair, and I'm just really trying to keep it as healthy as possible postpartum. So to know that it has that heat protector element in it is absolutely amazing. You should also know that there is an anti-tangle tech, and this keeps your hair smooth and protected while styling. So if you're looking looking for curls that are not like overly curly, this is your new touch-up tool. The Curl Secret by Conair. You can shop Curl Secret by Conair exclusively at Ulta. Hair goes in, curl comes out, just like magic. Evlo Fitness. I am so obsessed with lifting and strength training. It's truly changed my body. I cannot believe how much it has shrunk my body composition. It's not even like about losing so much weight. It's just shrunk me. It's like shrunk wrap me. I will never in my life not lift weights or do strength training. I am absolutely obsessed. And Evlo is created so you can lift and do strength training at home. So everything is taught by doctors of physical therapy to help you build muscle without wrecking your body, all from the comfort of your home. And they're all about effectiveness without extremes. I think this is one of the best ideas I've ever heard. Like you get a schedule. So like Monday is upper body day, Tuesday's lower body day, Wednesday is core, et cetera, et cetera. The entire week is structured for you and it's all designed to work on your nervous system and help you build muscle, which melts fat. Fitness is effective when it's consistent and they can help you be consistent. They're all about gentle consistency. We actually had the founder on this podcast. Her name is Dr. Shannon, and she really designed Evlo as your own little personal training session. If you want to save money and you want the fraction of the cost and you want to gain muscle and lose fat, you have to check them out. I personally think it's so anti-aging too to lift because it tightens your skin. I am all about lifting and strength training. Evlo is giving our listeners one free month. Everyone gets a free month. There's no excuse when you use code skinny at checkout. This is such a good place to start. Visit evlofitness.com to learn more and try their membership for 30 days with code SKINNY. I think for someone who has never gone through IVF, what are are all the things that happen? Like, what exactly are you doing? I I, I just would like Mm -hmm. to know for my own self, when you're in the IVF process, you say you did that four times. What exactly does one process look like? So every morning at about 6, 6.15, I'd have an appointment as a doctor where they would give me a scan and and check to where my eggs were. And then they would call me around four in the afternoon and tell, and uh, I'm sorry, also blood work. You'd get your blood taken every morning as well. And then, how long? 
Um, it could range anywhere from I had one cycle that was eight days. I had one cycle that was 16 days. Ooh. And so you're going get, uh, bruises all on your arms from getting your blood drawn so much. And then every day around 4.15, they'd call me and say, OK, here's your prescription for tonight with what you should be injecting yourself with. At the beginning, I couldn't inject myself. I had a nurse come over every night who is the sweetest woman ever. And she would come and give me my shots and I would cry. And then by the end of it, I was giving myself my shots and like didn't even think twice about it. How many shots? Usually two shots a night. I think sometimes there were might have been three. It's like I I, I was so in it. And now it's like a blur. Like I can hardly even remember. It's like it kind of just goes away. But then once I got pregnant, I had to start giving myself progesterone shots in my butt. So um, to help stay pregnant, to keep my hormones for each to, one of the pregnancy, even the chemical one, or I did it on the chemical ones too? Yeah. So it's a yeah. lot of shots. It's a lot of shots. And what? And a lot. What about your physical and mental state during this? Well, you can exercise, which was a real problem for me because I really, especially at that point in my life, really liked to exercise. While you're doing this, but when you're pregnant, yep. you can, yeah. Yeah, once okay. you're pregnant, okay. yeah. But during it, you can exercise. You can like walk. But you shouldn't be doing anything rigorous. And at that point in my life, I was like a rigorous exerciser. I was doing like an hour and a half exercise every day. So that mentally was a real problem for me. Um, I felt really bloated. And I just felt like I couldn't think about anything else. It's it was like, like you don't have the capacity. Egg, 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 egg. It was like all I could think about was that. And just so wound all the time. What does what your husband do to support you going through this? Because the, the hard thing that I think about this is, is that the man truly has no idea and you can't expect him to have mm-hmm. any idea. Mm-hmm. So it's a real mind fuck because you're you're in this with your partner, but your partner really cannot understand, but you want them yeah. to understand, but they're never going to understand. Yeah, it's a hard thing to connect on. I mean, he was so there for me, but he couldn't know exactly how I felt. And I also, I didn't want to just have that be the only thing that I could talk about in our relationship, even though that was the only thing I was thinking about. Like I still wanted to have normal conversations. So it was trying to, I, I remember like us planning dates and going out during it just to try to get my mind off things like going to a Broadway show or going to dinners just to think about something else and have something else to talk about. But once I would make it to the progesterone shots, he would give me those because it was a little bit more difficult to get back to my butt. And so he gave me all those shots and I always gave myself the ones on my stomach to myself, but he would do the butt shots. He's, it sounds supportive. Very supportive. So when you finally get pregnant with Iris, did you have an easy pregnancy? Please tell me. You I had the easiest okay. pregnancy. Good. Yeah. Oh, and, and at the very beginning, I was so nervous to be pregnant because I thought that I was going to lose it. And so I was had real, real bad anxiety. And I had a real bad scare. I had gone to Miami for the food festival. It was like a week before I was going to tell anyone I was pregnant. I was so excited. I'd made it to 11 weeks and I got to my hotel room and just started bleeding like terrible. I was sure I was having a miscarriage. I went to the hospital and I was fine. And I called my doctor and he said, I don't want you to carry anything heavier than a water bottle. And Ryan flew down and met me because I had just gone with my mom. He flew down and then he flew back to New York with me. As soon as I got on the airplane, again, bleeding like crazy. I was sure that I was losing this baby and I was okay. And then I got a terrible flu. It was right before COVID. I got a terrible flu and I thought if I made it through that and made it through this flu, this baby is coming and I was fine and I had the easiest pregnancy. I think I maybe had two days of morning sickness and the rest was a breeze and I loved being pregnant. You loved it. I loved it. I never felt prettier. I never felt better in my body. I loved it. I I gained like 55 pounds. I enjoyed every bite of Velveeta mac and cheese that I had. (laughs) Damn, that sounds good. (laughs) I think that that because you had such an appreciation of how difficult it was to get pregnant, that maybe there was like a a gratefulness to the Mm -hmm. pregnancy. I think so, too. Because, God, I wish I felt like you felt when I was pregnant. It was like... I know everybody has different experiences. Like feel differently yeah (laughs) oh my god i felt like i was that fucking girl from willy wonka the blueberry rolling around (laughs) veruca salt is that her name 
So I thought the Veruca Salt's the the brat one. I don't know what her name is. I don't know. You have to Google it, Wolf. I don't know what her name is. She's some. She's the blueberry. Um, when you are having a baby and you have such a career, what mm-hmm. was that like to balance all that? Were they okay with you taking time off? Well, I didn't take any time off. I never missed a single show because it was COVID and we were filming oh. from home. Oh, that's nice. So I got to have all my time with my baby and simultaneously be working. And uh, my production company that does the kitchen. It's a lot of women who work there. They were so supportive. We were doing everything on Zoom and I would have Iris in the little baby Bjorn chair sitting there and be filming my food segments with them on the Zoom. And Ryan was filming me. He's a producer. So he was able to film everything and do my sound and my lights. And so I had a really unique experience that I know if I had had her in regular times, i probably would have missed three or four months of my show. Wow. So it like all fell into place. It really did. Yeah. And- it, I mean, it it was the best of times in the worst of times. So I, I was uh, in a way felt guilty that we were having like such an incredible time when so many people were hurting so bad. You're the second person that said the best of times and worst of times on oh, the show really? this week. And I oh, always wow. find, I don't know why it's like weird when that stuff happens. Don't you think? Synergistic. Yes. Because like nobody ever says it and then they yeah. said it. And like, okay. Eh, so we're going to talk to all the people who don't know what the fuck they're doing in the kitchen, <laughs> a.k.a. me. Talk to yourself. Uh, <laughs> you are incredibly talented mm. in the kitchen. And but, but I told you. I've told you this like five times since I've seen you, but you do make it like easy to digest. I don't feel overwhelmed. I also feel like sometimes people in certain careers overcomplicate things and mm-hmm. make you almost feel like there's a superiority in it. Uh-huh, I Do you know, know exactly what I mean? What and you it's mean. like yep. it's it makes it intimidating. It's almost like mean girlish. Fashion maybe too. Yeah. Like there's yes. like a there's like a energy. Yes. And sometimes uh-huh. I think, you know, with certain chefs, there's that mm-hmm, energy. But mm-hmm. with you it feels like it feels like I can do it. <laughs> well I appreciate that. Good. That's what I want. I want people to feel empowered to take my recipes and feel like I can do this, I can make this and I can enjoy it. And it shouldn't be something that is uh, uh, like uh, intimidating and that you get in the kitchen and you don't have a good time. Like you should be having fun doing it. So I want people to feel like they can take one of these recipes. There's not a lot of ingredients. There's not a lot of steps. Hey, I can make this. And guess what? If you completely fuck it up, you can get on Postmates or Seamless or whatever and order dinner. So what's like a, a 101, someone who's never been in the kitchen, like cooking kit Where situation? should people start? Yeah. Where should they, well, the basics? I think that uh, when you find a recipe you want to make, read it start to finish first. Okay. So that you know where you're going. That's the first step that I didn't do. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, otherwise, you're just walking blind into it. It could say like that it needs to refrigerate for two hours and you're hoping to have it on the table in 20 minutes. So you got to read it. Set out all your ingredients first. Make it like you're doing a cooking show. If it says chop the onions, have them in a little bowl chopped up. Have everything set up for yourself so that then it's just a matter of assembling it. Um, thank you, Lauren. Um so I, I think that it's just kind of being prepared like in anything in life. You hear that, Lauren? Prepared. <laughs> okay. So so if someone wants to start with one recipe that they can make at home, this is for myself, for their kids and their husband, what is something that is easy, streamlined, quick, efficient to make? I think chicken breasts are a really good place to start. Uh, they're easy to dry out, but it's also one of those things that everybody wants to make and everybody for the most part, likes having a piece of chicken. I think sheet pan suppers are a great way to go. What is a sheet pan supper? I don't know what that means. A sheet pan supper is where you put everything on one baking sheet and bake it. You just put it in the oven and then it comes out the way you Yes. So get your chicken breasts, season them with whatever seasonings you like, cut up some sweet potato cubes, some broccoli, put those all on the pan together, put it in the oven at like 400 degrees for about... 25, 35 minutes and you've got dinner ready. I also think that salmon is one of the most forgiving, easy things to make. It might sound like it's challenging. I think fish can be intimidating, 
But again, salmon in the oven is super simple and you're going to have dinner ready really quickly. When you say sheet pan, do you have to use aluminum foil or can you use one of those like French mats that I use for cookies? You, you can use that. Slip, I really slip, like not. Um, just having parchment paper. Okay. I get the parchment paper. That's what I always line my sheet pan with. And then I can just throw it away and there's hardly any cleanup. How do you know how long to cook it and how many degrees? Well, you can Google it. Yeah, but then, if you, what, what, but what I'm saying for your own chicken and your oh, own. For me, I, I cook just about everything at like 400, 425. It, you're and making it seem too easy. There's something like. I promise you it is easy. Like don't get in your head on it. It's easy. Okay. And you can kind of look at it and know. Don't like, go too easy on the seasoning, though, Lauren. Okay, you need to get some seasoning on there. That's you have some dry very, chicken. very important. You got to have a good amount of salt too. People don't salt their food enough, and that's like the number one thing. Like when we're, whenever we're judging a challenge show, what always trips people up is like they forget to put enough salt. Why don't you do like a layman's, like a new person who doesn't know what they're doing, cooking show? <laughs> <laughs> like cooking 101. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have like people like me come on that don't know what they're doing and it could be a cooking show with just like random people it's that have no idea. It's a good idea. Like I, I like those simple basic recipes. That's what I'm into. My last cookbook was called It's Not Complicated because that's what I, I don't want complicated recipes. I don't want complicated food. You know where the first place I saw you in? Hmm. What do you think I'm going to say? Instagram? People Magazine. Oh, really? Way back in the day. Uh-huh. I'm talking like like maybe like 13 years ago. Is that, wow, was that yeah. track? Yeah. That, I mean, I, that's the first time I saw you. It wasn't the internet. Wow. It was in People Magazine. Work for what reason? I, I think she was making a recipe. Did mm-hmm. you used to make recipes in People Magazine or am I crazy? I mean, I've done several things with them over the years. So I'm sure okay. there was a recipe in there probably that you saw. Maybe Us Weekly. Okay. That could be it too. Okay. And I yeah. saw and I thought... Wow, I think I could do this. I never tried the try it. <laughs> oh, here we are 10 years later. What are some essentials that people need to have in their kitchen? You and I talked off air about crop top or crop crop top. A crop, a crop top, top, a crop top. Yeah. or an Instapot. What are some um, other things? I mean, I love a slow cooker. I think that you need a, a good nonstick skillet that is a, a non-toxic nonstick skillet. Um, you need uh, a heavy bottom big pan that like you could put pasta in and toss. You need a pasta pot. I love a Le Creuset Dutch oven. I think those are great. What is that? Um, That's like, you know, those really pretty ceramic pots with the lids and you can make like a pot roast in there or you can make a pot of chili. You can braise meat for a long time. I love braised meat. I'm very into that. What is braised meat? (laughs) Like braised short ribs or or pot roast. But last night, what did we have? Last night we had prime rib. Is that was that braised? No, so that was roasted. Got you it. see the Ooh, trouble yeah. I'm in here? <laughs> yeah, you fine. see the trouble I'm in here. But she's interested. Yes. I am interested. Yeah, yeah. And, Start me and she got a crock pot. pot. Yeah. I'm telling you, Look, you're gonna think she's a domestic goddess. Katie, we had a crock pot, crock but it pot. wasn't to the aesthetic no, that no, she no. preferred. We, yes, and so, that's what I told you last night. Some we of ha- them are unattractive. I, I come home. I need a non toxic one, like you said. It wasn't non toxic. I'm not gonna cook. For my family and slave over the stove and have it not be a non-toxic meal. Let me meal. tell you something. I buy these things because I will like I will take these in this, these things mm-hmm. in my own hands, right? Mm-hmm. And then I'll show up at some of our relatives' house or like I'll see some of like her siblings and it's like there's my shirt, there's my crock pot, there's nothing, but I'll have no idea how they got it. I just like oh you bought the same <laughs> one. No, no way. And I go and I realize she just well, gives my stuff I away. I do the same thing, Lauren. I give stuff away. I, I just don't want all this crap in my house. I honestly, I this your is brother, really like, weird. Damn, but I pretty feel good. like, that's mine. It's, it's energetically freeing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to give it away because one, yeah. I feel like it's being, it's people are using it. Mm-hmm. And two, it's minimalizing the space. Yeah. <laughs> don't junk it up with all this stuff. Okay. So what are the essentials that people need? Okay. Um, you need a good chef's knife. A sharp one. Um, you need a paring knife and a bread knife. That's it. You don't need a whole big knife set. Um, things that you should always have around to make your food taste good. Of course, herbs and spices, lemon, garlic. Um, I always have a bunch of different pastas, grains, canned beans, canned tomatoes, and you can throw together a pretty quick dinner. I love to do quick pastas. Like I want to make a pasta where the sauce is done and the amount of time it took for the pasta to cook. And do you use store-bought pasta or sauce or do you make your own? Well, sometimes I use store-bought. I mean, I have no problem with that. My daughter loves a jar of Reyes, you know, just so if I'm in a hurry, I'll have that. But 
I usually will make our own, like whether it's taking a head of broccoli and chopping it up real fine and sauteing it with some garlic and olive oil and tossing that with pasta water and, and Parmesan cheese. That sounds and like I could do that. You could totally do that. It's done in like 12 minutes. It's so you fast. You could get a little more into cooking too. Yeah, I mean, like, listen, I, I think like, I think what's happened is I think Lauren believes that this is, I mean, listen, obviously there's levels to this stuff and, you know, people take all sorts of creative approaches to culinary experiences, right? But I, I think like some of the basic stuff are pretty basic. It is. It is. It's pretty basic, but there's something about it that intimidates people. And so it's kind of taking away that layer of intimidation and telling yourself, look at everything you do in your life. You have got it so together. You are able to do so many different things and juggle the, all these different things going on in your life. You can definitely cook. I'll tell you what's intimidating. If you want to. You don't have to Th either. This is the therapy session conversation. This is what's intimidating. Michael is the type of person that I could make something and he will give a critique. No, no, no let me finish. Let you me can't finish. do that. Okay. So, <laughs> so you also do this with gifts. So if I get like, if there's like a critique, he gives uh -huh. it, which it's like, I don't want to invest my time and mm -hmm. my energy mm -hmm. into something where he's going to be like, that was an eight out of 10. Well, you asked for my feedback. Right. So, 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 so if I'm going to take my time, which I really value time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and put it towards doing something and then have him critique no, it. No, no, no. And then... He eats a bite and then I have to do all the dishes. It just feels like You've it's never a never had waste. to do all the dishes. What are you talking yes, about? Yes, I do not, do the dishes. If, if it, we're having dinner. Let's I do the, <laughs> be honest here. Let's I do the dishes suck. Yeah. yeah. So it just feels, I think what it is for me is it's not that the recipe feels overwhelming as much as it is. It feels overwhelming to me to take my time and energy, put it into a mm -hmm. dish, have him rate it a 7.5. Yeah, Lauren has a lot. Then of, have him yeah. have two bites and then have my kids have two bites, which you know sometimes oh, yeah. that happens. Well, oh, yeah. And it's like, well, I just wasted. I'm not going to say wasted. Mm -hmm. I just invested mm -hmm. 45 minutes of time and now mm -hmm. I have to clean up and you think it's a seven out of five. Listen, well, Lauren, I have nights that I feel the exact same way as that. She's she's working through a lot <laughs> of childhood trauma here where she needs <laughs> her dad. I love you, Brad. He's, you know, Lauren could cook a piece of, you know, like my dad's uncooked turkey and give you food poisoning for a week and her dad will tell her that it's the greatest thing that he's ever had in his <laughs> life. And I think that my approach to her is sometimes saying like, hey, you know, the last time you made me that turkey dish, I was shitting my brains out for a month. <laughs> and like, we need to maybe cook it a little bit more. And she will take that I as gave like, food poisoning. Oh, no. Yeah, so she will take that as like, you're such an asshole. And like, uh -huh, why would you ever uh -huh. say? And I'm like, well, we have to have a middle ground here where I can provide some feedback <laughs> to say next time I don't need to go to the hospital. You know what Sometimes I mean? I'll be recipe testing and I'll have Ryan taste it and he'll tell me what he doesn't think is right with the dish and I'll be pissed at him. Yeah. Even though I was asking for his opinion and yeah. asking him about a new recipe, what's it taste like? And he'll go, mm, you know, I really think that you could have added more X, Y, Z. And I'm like, fuck you. Yeah, you're like, this you don't, you don't have taste buds. Yeah, you idiot. Yeah. You don't she know what you're talking about. does make yeah an absolutely incredible sandwich. And say it. Say it. I, knew, I was going to ask you to say it. What's say on it. the sandwich? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of I stuff know, on it, but whatever she does. I've perfected the sandwich. Yeah, she kills Tell the me sandwich about it. Is it Katie Lee? <laughs> <laughs> this is the trick to the sandwich. She knows the proper condiment proportions. Um, this is the proportions. trick. Mm. You have to take mm. a piece of toast and lightly toast it. Then you put a little bit of mayonnaise, not too much because he doesn't like white cream. So just a little bit of mayonnaise. No, that's not true. A little bit of mustard. I just don't like it too much. You don't like the consistency. Then you take the cheese and put it on the mayonnaise mm -hmm. and the mustard, but you broil it. Oh, okay. But you only broil it for 30 seconds. So mm -hmm. it, the cheese gets melty. Then you take it out and then you cover the cheese and pepperoncinis. Pepperoncinis are the trick to a good sandwich. Is that how you say it? Pepper no, probably not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pepperoncini, but that's all right. I know what you're talking about. There's another negative pronunciation review. <laughs> you have to chop the pepperoncinis oh. up. Because you want to get the little seeds because it's good. It's mm -hmm, like kind of spicy. Mm -hmm. Then you put the meat on. Then you put a little bit more mayo and mustard. And then you put the lettuce. Thinly, thinly sliced tomato because you don't mm. want it like wet. And then you put a little bit of a sprinkle of salt, maybe a raw red onion on top. And if you want, you could put a little bit of red pickled onions and you cut it in mm. half and you do a Diet Coke and 
I'm, I'm starving. I'm now. telling you, that sounds it's, delicious. It's really I good. make a sandwich like I give a blowjob. It's a very specific <laughs> formula that and I listen, know. I don't have a lot of critiques for the blowjob. So, you so know. this is I why mean, a sandwich and a blowjob. You must be yeah. a really happy man. I mean, listen, this is why I don't. I you know I pick and choose my battles. I'm like I'm not gonna critique the turkey so much if I am gonna lose the sandwich and the blowjob. I would, as a man, I would rather have those two things than maybe the pot roast. But you could I, you also know. put some salami on top of it and a piece of prosciutto to give it like co- oh, I'm telling I'm here for but, that. But to me, that's like a, that's a, a more complicated, harder thing. Like I feel I like might some win of the on things, your show if you did something. I mean, like, if there was a sandwich competition, I think you'd have it. She's got it. And the pickled onions, the pepperoncini, like having that pickle moment, I think makes it. The, the, I, I'm and the sprinkle wrong. of salt. The sprinkle of salt. The pepperoncini. But how like what I'll say, like I like to that, give the feedback. Those like are if, so underrated. I think people mm-hmm. should use those on so many different things. So good. If she's, yeah, if the she, best. If she's drank too much one night and she wants to give me a blowjob, I'm like, hey, that one was a little toothy. Like that's, you know. You don't I, give I, me I that have, much feedback I on have that, to though. give the, no, no, it's, normally it's good, but I need to give that feedback. Yeah, because, but yeah, I get a 10 out of 10. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, I think that. Wolf wants a sandwich the, and a blowjob. The process of cooking is I think the, the, the thing is maybe over time you get better and better at refining the the, mm-hmm. the dishes. And so I think she sometimes, if I'm like, hey, that could use a little more salt. I'm not saying it's a critique. I'm saying like I would prefer that. Yeah, we know what salt. you're saying. We don't want to hear your opinion though. But yeah, I get it. it's I like when somebody's made you a meal and they have something negative, the person has something negative to say back. Katie Lee just Doesn't said it last I was good. fighting for my fucking life the last time she made a meal. No I one was, cares. I barely made it. <laughs> okay. I want to talk about now, currently, what you're working on, what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So tell us about, first, let's start with the show, because I feel like that's the foundation of what you mm-hmm. do. So the kitchen started in 2013. I can't believe it'll be 10 years in December. Um, it's a lot of pretty, practice on pretty TV. crazy. Yeah. A long I mean, time too. it feels like um, just so easy and second nature now when I used to go on at the beginning and I'd feel nervous and butterflies. Now it's just like nothing. You don't even think about it. I don't even think about it. Wow. Same like if I'm doing a cooking segment, it just feels so natural and, and just what I'm supposed to be doing. So uh, kitchen where I think around 500 episodes at this point, Damn. my co-hosts have become like family members. We have a group chat and I know what their kids are doing. I know where they're going on vacation. It's like, we just are always in communication. It's really great to have that community feeling. And I feel that way about the people behind the cameras, too. I love my producers. And uh, that's been like the greatest catalyst for my career. I mean, it changed my life. I wouldn't have met Ryan if I hadn't done the kitchen because I wouldn't have gotten beach bites. I wouldn't have Iris without the kitchen. I wouldn't have my career. Uh, it's really been an incredible blessing. And what about your wine? OK, so. This wine is so good. I had the opportunity last night to try the red and now we're drinking the rosé. Tell us about why you created this and like you I feel like you really paid attention to the details when creating this. So the wine is called Kind of Wild and it's organic, zero sugar. It's free from any harmful additives or preservatives. And really, this was important to me because I have been eating organic food using organic cleaning products. All these things in my life were organic except wine. And it was not something that I really thought about even. And the more I started learning about it, learning about the preservatives, the additives, all of the chemicals that can be in a bottle of wine, I thought, I don't really feel good about drinking this, but I love wine. I I can't give it up. I love it. It's like food and wine go hand in hand. So I really wanted to do an organic wine. And then I wanted zero sugar because, I mean, I'm I'm a health conscious person. I I like fitting in my jeans and I like not having as bad of a hangover the next day because without having that spike of sugar, um, the same with not having the additives or preservatives, you're not going to get that same hangover that you would from conventional wine. You know, it's funny is I I didn't I. Obviously, we were drinking your wine last night at your at your house and at your dinner, and I didn't realize I knew it was your wine, but I didn't realize it was organic and had and had all these characteristics. I didn't feel hungover and this we, morning. Today, like we were at, we were there like midnight, right? It was, yeah, we mid- had like a five hour dinner. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I like, loved it. Get out. Our bad. I loved sorry, it. we kind of maybe oh overstayed my God, our welcome. So yeah, yeah. um, <laughs> but you know, like we've done three of these today and have been on fire. Yeah, you know? I, I, I feel good. Feel amazing. 
Well, you know, it's you don't have to have your. I'll tell you. It's not required by law to have your ingredients on a wine label, mm-hmm. but we put them on there. So you can look That's on cool. the back and see that there are, are like four ingredients. That's super cool. That's um, the only wine I've ever seen with ingredients on the back of a label. Yeah, it's not required. And it's a vegan wine as well, which at when I first started this, I thought vegan isn't all wine vegan. But a lot of times in the filtering process, there are animal products that are added. Wine can be filtered through like fish guts. Yep. So having a vegan wine, you're just taking out that other component. I would be crazy not to ask you before you leave what your health, wellness and beauty tips are. One, because you're beautiful, but two, Thank also you. you're around all this food and you look so amazing. What are these like non-negotiable sort of like standards, daily habits that you do every day? Well, first of all, thank you. Um, I That has changed a lot for me. Before I had a child, I worked out every day about an hour and a half a day. That's what and you said. What, That's what crazy. kind of workouts were you doing? I, I was real into Tracy Anderson. I, I did that workout like hardcore and I loved it. Man, and she's really built a and, brand. A lot of people say Tr- Tracy Anderson. Yeah, I was in great shape. I was like a size zero, size two, like and eating whatever I wanted and and just very, very strong. Um, after having a baby, it was like I just didn't really have time for that anymore. Yeah. And when well, really, when I started IVF and all that, it was like it kind of started dwindling off for me. Um, and and sometimes I wonder, like, if I just stressed my body so much. But um Anywho, I'm going on a tangent. So after having a child, I just don't have that kind of time to devote to exercise. So now I do about 30 minutes. I love to power walk. Um, she used to let me power walk with her in the stroller. That doesn't happen as much anymore. And then I like to do an obey. I, I get online and I, I really like working out at home. That was something I started in pandemic and have just kept up with it because I like having it on my own schedule and my own terms. On the Obey Fitness app. Yeah, yeah. You're being, welcome, Mark. Keep going. Yeah, Keep right. I've <laughs> <laughs> just being able to exercise when I want. I've started now twice a week going to a trainer um, to lift heavy weights, which I never, I was scared to death of heavy weights. I thought that I was going to be bulky and I, I was just thought, no, 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 never lifted more than three pounds. Now I'm lifting really heavy weights and I feel like I've gotten tighter and firmer and just so much stronger. I don't have muscle aches and pains, joint pain the way that I used to. I just feel overall healthier. What, which class do you like on Obey? Like if someone wants to go download Obey, which is the class that the the Katie Lee class? I usually do the strength classes because I want to lift weights um, or yoga. It's and like you said, you could do it out of your house. Yeah. Yeah, I know we've like we've like beat the dead horse with the weightlifting conversation on this show, but I just like Lauren started weightlifting. Mm -hmm. I think as we age, and maybe like we didn't, a lot of people don't realize this until maybe they get into their mid thirties or after they have children. You know, luckily that was just like the Mm -hmm. form of working out that I found at a young age that I Mm -hmm. like. But but you're also a man. No, no, no. But sure. But I think like people just don't realize like structurally and from a posture perspective, Mm -hmm. and just from like you know overall. You know, aesthetically, I think it is honestly the best anti-aging thing you can I do so too. for your entire body. This is so weird, but I feel like it tightens my skin to my body. I get that. Like it, it there's mm-hmm. something about like the way the muscle looks against the skin when you lift heavy. Mm-hmm. It It's like a collagen or I don't know. It's mm-hmm. something. There's something that the skin does. And don't you think it's like such a confidence booster too? Yeah. Like, I'll look at a weight and think there's no way I can do that. And then after I finish the 10 reps of it, I'm like, yeah. And also, I'm you just so feel strong. good. Like, there's serotonin. Mm-hmm. It's interesting I'm, I'm for me to it. watch her do it because that's how, when I was a kid, little kid, I think that was one of the first confidence boosting things that I did was like, oh, I can like lift a heavy weight or I can do some push ups. I think a lot of young mm-hmm. men find that early. And I watched her be like, oh, did you see how much I lifted mm-hmm. there and I, and I think a lot of women are discovering like that for me that that was the that was the thing where i started to identify and find my confidence when i was a young man mm-hmm. i gained 60 pounds with my pregnancy too and that's a, a big part of how i lost it is weightlifting yeah I yeah love because it. you burn so many calories i also started weight watchers after i had iris and that was a big help for me as well and i've done that since and started working with them as a spokesperson. So I really believe in that program. And the other thing that I always do, um, my grandma always said, eat only fruit before noon. 
And I so that's what I do for the most part. I have a big bowl of fruit every morning. And it's kind of like feels like you're giving your digestion a break and almost like intermittent fasting, but you're eating because fruit's so easily digested. I feel like then I got all my antioxidants in. I got a bunch of vitamins in and I can go about my day and and eat what I'm going to eat the rest of the day. What about any beauty wellness things that you do? Beauty wellness. Um, I, I don't do a lot of different things. Like I, I'll get facials from time to time. I'm like you. I know you love face massage. I love face massage. And I have started going in to like a nail salon. And instead of being like, can I get a 10 minute back rub? I was like, can I have a 10 minute face massage? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's like such a good tip at the foot yeah. spot. Even. Yes. Yes. I, I asked for a face massage. I've brought my own lotion before. And I just feel like that makes a huge difference. There's so much tension in your face. I It blows mm-hmm. my fucking mind how many people work so hard on their body and they work out their mm-hmm. body and they think that they don't have to work out their face. I, I like I it's literally mm-hmm. one of the most anti-aging things that you yes. can do. And I've become obsessed with your ice roller. You gave me that and I use it like when I go to the studio, I take it in the car with me and I sit in the car and it's almost like meditative on the way there. I'm just rolling my face and feeling like that's like my moment and my time of peace. Well, I brought you a body sculptor. Uh, <gasps> oh, the body sculptor. Yeah, I brought Yay! you the body sculptor. Uh, you can take it. You could take the body sculptor to the nail salon with your own oil oh. and just <laughs> tell him to get in there. I I, I'm it. like finger bang me. I don't even care oh, whatever what? they do. <laughs> What's the fuck is going on? I'm like, I'm like, like please give me a massage. <laughs> Whatever you know, they do. There is a great foot, You know, after this week on the right show, you're now. starting to say some questionable things. And I'm starting to wonder what the fuck is going on. It's how we all feel. Yeah. <laughs> Tired. I love a massage. I just want to be touched, basically. <laughs> I go to the foot spa. I'm like, Listen, can I have 90 uh, minutes with someone on each foot? Uh-huh. If a finger slips in, what are you going to do? <laughs> I think we're at a point in our relationship, too, where like, honestly, same for me. I'm like, if something... <laughs> something yeah. happens it's like I'm not inviting it but like I'm also like oh, I'm a little tired it's like you know, I don't like, even know if I have the energy to tell somebody no yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh we, we had we had this comedian come on our podcast and she, uh, Laura Clary and she mm-hmm. said she was at a like a foot spa and they gave her a happy ending and she, <laughs> like she orgasmed and then she said I said, oh, like, like, how was it? She was like, it was great. She's like, it was so great. I came back two days later and did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has even attempted with me. Uh, hey, I got a funny story that before, because I know you gotta, we got to get you out of here, is... After this, fuck, yeah, gotta, you got to be careful of this one. Have, you might have to tell you off air. I have... No, I'm just going to say it. I don't care. Okay. Fuck it. Okay. I have friends. They're two twin brothers. Mm-hmm. Okay? And they went to, they were... One of them went to go get a massage one day. And as he's getting the massage, it's starting to end. And lo and behold, like all of a sudden he feels a hand on his, you know, his, his area. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What the hell is going on? And he just stops. And again, like she goes back and is like, what, what's going on? And he looks at him and she goes, hey, you like this every time. And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> he's like, this is my first time here. Twin brother was going in all the time. Oh and she no was confused because she, she thought it was the same, same person. <laughs> Did he give as good of a tip as his brother? I, I don't know. You think he could have just told me? I think well, he was like, flustered. "What's the name of the place <laughs> and the yeah, Google right. location?" Oh my Katie, God. where can everyone find you? Pimp yourself out. Where can they buy your wine? Where can they support what you're doing? What's next for you? Tell us all the things. You can find my wine at kindofwildwines.com, and we're going to be expanding into more retailers at the first of the year. Um, you can follow me at Katie Lee Beagle on Instagram, on TikTok. Um, I feel like I'm just learning TikTok. I'm so behind the eight ball on that. But Instagram, I'm always on there posting reels and recipes. And the kitchen is on every Saturday on Food Network. All you have to do on TikTok is make those miso chocolate chip cookies and it'll <laughs> blow up. I swear people would just love to hear your two minute tips like that. That's a just hack. Just the quick and easies. Yeah. You have to send me that recipe. It was really I will. Cool. I feel and like he- for what you do, you would kill it on TikTok. I don't go on TikTok, if, so I don't know if you already are killing it, but I, I feel like I'm you not kill it. killing it at all by any stretch of the imagination. I, it's like I can't even remember to get on there and post something. There's just so many things that you, 
you got to do with because like technology. you have a, like, there's a reason so to happy. go and see what you're doing there like yeah. i would i would honestly i'm not a big ticker i follow you on tiktok you know what i want to make for you guys this is off topic but it, now that i know you like the miso chocolate chip cookies i've got these other cookies that ryan is obsessed with he named them dooger scoodles just to make fun of me and my west virginia names for things it's Ritz crackers with a lot of peanut butter. You make like a Ritz cracker peanut butter sandwich and then you dip it in melted chocolate and let it harden. So it's oh, like God a damn. chocolate peanut butter salty cookie cracker. I'm coming back Go over tonight. Go make those on TikTok. Mm-hmm. You'll go mm-hmm. viral. Yeah, I think that that's what See, I'm going to have to do. That's yeah. what I'm saying. I would. I think that's, yeah, a, that's I, a TikTok I, right there. That's, that's one mm-hmm. minute. Like It's quick and easy. Those are my go-to Christmas cookies. I'm going to go on Damn. TikTok and I'm going to teach how to make the best sandwich and give the best <laughs> blowjob. And those are my hacks of the day. I, I kind of want the blowjob <laughs> tip. <laughs> the blowjob tip. Okay, there's a couple tips just before we go. The first tip is you got to do the coin. The uh-huh. coin is like is like the, the finger to the finger. It's a Lisa Renna tip. I learned it in her book when I was, I think, 12 years old. Um, it's it's the coin, but you got to tighten the coin. The second tip is, and I learned this from gay men, when you <laughs> when you give a blowjob, you have to give a blowjob like a man. So I think what girls... Well, this is... No, this is true. You don't... No complaints from you, peanut gallery. You, you you have to give it like a man. And here's I think what, what she's, she's saying. They, they understand what, the equipment. Mm-hmm, no, mm-hmm. yes, they understand the equipment, but they're also ag- aggressive. Whereas like a woman, like you're delicate and you're soft. No timid blowjobs. No timid blowjobs. Then obviously we got to be careful of teeth, but you don't want to forget about the taint. <laughs> 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 well, it's like, she's like bitch, bitch is right. <laughs> you don't want to forget about the balls. You got to spend a lot of time in the balls. And you don't want to forget about like the sensitive parts and you have to really be multitasking. It's a twist of the hand, a flick of the wrist. It's the hanging on the balls. To wrap this up, it's why <laughs> it's why I've never complained about the cooking. Ryan's going to be thrilled when I go home this evening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> give it, give a blowjob like a gay man. He'll love it. I love it. Best advice I ever got from a woman who'd been married like 50 years. I said, what can you tell me? And she said, you got to do two things to keep a man happy. You got to feed him and you got to fuck him. And that's it. I was saying that we were I just mean, saying again on another better. show that like we're kind of just big, dumb animals. We don't really, <laughs> you know, but you know, we've we've also had people Are on the show. Are you covering and, your boner with your knee? Yeah, now we got to be. We, <laughs> we gotta, listen, no, I, I can't tell if I'm hungry or horny after the show. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, we're pretty simple, I think. On that you know. note, everyone go follow at Katie Lee. At Katie, at Katie Lee Beagle. At Katie yep. Lee Beagle on TikTok and Instagram. And hopefully we can get your hacks on TikTok yes. too. Because I want those miso cookies. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Cheers. Katie. Thank you guys so much for having me. This was so fun. <laughs> <laughs>